Hey, this is Scooter. Uh, I wanted to do a short tutorial video, which won't be very short, uh, to teach people how to do geo-referencing of uh, images, maps, stuff like that. So it's something I tried to do for a while and couldn't figure out exactly how to do it. Uh, I heard that you were supposed to be able to do it through Google Earth Pro, but I never did quite figure that out. Um, obviously you can do it with some, some expensive um, GIS systems like ArcGIS, stuff like that, but a lot of us don't have $1,800 to just spend on a software suite like that just for fun. So anyway, what I did was I eventually found a way to do it, and so what I'm going to teach you is the very basics, and it's going to be using free software, uh, for the most part free. Uh, so the different programs and things that you're going to want to know how to use or you're going to learn how to use for this whole process, uh, there's three or four. Um, the most common one, which I'm not going to really explain a whole lot, is Avenza Maps, and a lot of planters know how that works. Um, basically it takes a different types of files like a TIFF file or a PDF or um, I think PNGs work also. So some of those types of files they can be geo-referenced which means that in addition to the image um, geographical information can be incorporated into the file and so when you load the map into or the image into this program called Avenza Maps it shows you exactly where you are on that map and so it's very much like Google Maps um, but the advantage is you don't have to have cell service to make this work. So you do have to have a cell phone or a tablet which has a GPS in it. And so if you're talking cell phones, pretty much every smartphone nowadays has a, cell, has a GPS. If you're talking about tablets, uh, something that's a Wi-Fi only tablet will not have a GPS, but if it has the ability to take a SIM card uh, and to work on a cell network, then it should have a GPS in it. Okay. So, like I say, you don't have to be in cell service for this to work. So, this is how foresters are creating maps of stuff out in the middle of nowhere. We can load them onto our mobile devices, and using GPS technology, we can see exactly where we are on that map. And the reason it works without cell technology is because GPS satellites up in the sky, they, they don't listen or talk to devices on the ground. All they do is broadcast a signal. Now, there's, I think, about 32 of them right now. And as long as you've got at least four of them in the sky above you at any given time broadcasting signals, all the different devices on the ground receiving those signals can figure out where each of those devices are individually. Okay, so look into Avenza Maps if you haven't already learned how to use it. Uh, a second thing that is useful but not critical is you could have a GPS app on your phone. And there's lots of free ones. Um, there's uh, just go onto the Play Store, the Google Play Store, or the Apple Store, and look for one. Look for one that's got a high rating and that's free. And most of these, you know, it just it does the same function as having a handheld GPS, like a Garmin or something like that. You can just hold it, take a look, let it get its reading, and you can see exactly what your latitude and longitude are. Okay, so that's useful, but that's not critical for this uh, tutorial. Uh, a third thing that's very useful is some image editing software. Now I'm going to use Photoshop just because I use Photoshop every day and it's like the most important program in my uh, life. So the only problem is Photoshop you have to buy and so a lot of you won't have Photoshop on your laptops. Any free image editing program will do and basically all you need is the ability to bring an image in and save it as a different type of image. That can be useful. Being able to crop an image is useful because, you know, say you've got a huge image and all you're interested is in is the part in the center, like a certain block or something like that, a certain feature. So you may want to be able to cut off all that extra stuff so your file sizes are smaller. Um, so cropping, resizing, um, yeah, just the basics for image editing. Uh, you may also want to be able to type text and lay it onto your image before you go through the geo-referencing process, that's handy. You may be able to, or you may want to be able to draw lines, polygons, shapes, points, stuff like that. That can be useful too. I don't do that very often. I'm usually just interested in getting the image that I'm turning into a map, cropping it down to a decent size, there's no extra info, and then saving it, and then going ahead with a different software package to do the geo-referencing. Um, what else might you need? I think the only other thing is the geo-referencing software. So there's 
a package called QGIS, which is free. It's open source. Um, there's a whole group of uh, coders around the world that have been working on this, developers working on this for a while, for several years, and they've turned it into a very comprehensive package. Uh, it's available for Mac, for Windows, stuff like that. So I'm going to go through the process um, of trying to install it on this laptop. Now, I have been using it. I uninstalled it. So I could go through the process of reinstalling it on a screen so you can see what's going on. Most of it, to speed things up, I'm going to put on fast forward or skip big sections. Okay, so let's go, uh, let's go to the laptop and start looking for the software. And by the way, if, you, uh, if you're looking for tutorials about QGIS, just do a search. There's all kinds of them online. A lot of them have um, files that you can download and play with. Shape files, graphics files, um, comma separated value files, all sorts of things that all relate to uh, stuff that QGIS can do. Now, I'm going to assume that you know a few basics. Uh, I'm going to assume that you know what latitudes and longitudes are and that you understand how GPSs work. Um, if you don't know anything about GIS, that stands for Geographic Information Systems, this book, GIS for Dummies, um, it's tedious, it's boring, it was painful to read. Uh, I did learn some things from it. So some of the biggest things um, you can find online, uh, I would say the biggest thing is if you don't understand the difference between raster and vector files, that's something that you want to research. Short version, a raster file is anything that's an image, um, like a JPEG, a GIF, um, that sort of stuff. A vector file, instead of having all the pixels there colored in in the image, uh, it basically uses mathematical formulas to express uh, how an image or how a uh, graphic comes up on the screen. So it's good for things like perfect circles, triangles, things like that. Um, but we're going to be working mostly with raster images today. So, yeah, that GIS book, tedious, but if you don't know much about GIS, learn about it somehow. You don't have to use that book. Uh, another thing, QGIS uh, tutorial book. This is quite good. Um, it's actually very good. Uh, but you can find a lot of that stuff online for free also, so you don't need that book. Uh, you have to understand... Um, what else? I think besides understanding GIS stuff, I think it's very important that you understand a fair amount about computers in general, like saving files, all that sort of stuff. Um, yeah. Anyway, let's go into uh, let's go into QGIS. So, QGISproject.org. Uh, we're going to look for download now. I'm um, going for Windows, yep, he knows I'm on Windows, standalone version, wait a sec, I'm not going to do that, I'm going to take the 64-bit. While this is downloading, let me explain one more thing that you definitely need to start learning to understand, and it's kind of complicated, uh, I don't fully, I'm not fully comfortable with it myself, uh, very confusing, but it basically relates to coordinate systems. And around the world, there are literally thousands of coordinate systems that have been used from, you know, five centuries ago up until the modern time, depending on what time period you're looking at, uh, where in the world you're looking at, um, the preferences of some of the local government officials, things like that. There's all kinds of different coordinate systems. And so basically these coordinate systems are often, often called uh, like uh, reference systems or datums, um, within those systems there's also variations called projections. And so basically you have to know, whenever you're working with any coordinates, you have to know what system they're in. And quite often there's a whole bunch of different types of systems that are very similar, but they're not perfectly similar. So for example, I think there's a system called NAD uh, NAD 27, North American Data 1927, something like that. That standard was updated in 1983 in the United States, and so all of a sudden a lot of people started using NAD 83, 
the difference between the two systems, like in, in one state, in New York, it might be that the new system, all the coordinates are 2 meters to the east and 10.4 meters to the south compared to the original system. So there's a lot of really weird stuff happening. So um, a couple of the systems that are really commonly used, WGS is a common one, and another one is the UTM system. Now, WGS, uh, latitudes and longitudes, a lot of you are familiar with that. Those are part of a WGS system, okay? UTMs uses a different thing where all the measurements are in meters. Um, let me show up a map of the world, okay? So you can see all these different numbers and then for each number you can go up or down to different letters. So for example, if I'm looking for something in Nova Scotia, I'm looking for number 20 and then up to T. So 20T is the grid, the UTM grid that I have to use if I'm doing work in Nova Scotia. If I use a grid like 13S and try to use coordinates from Nova Scotia, it's not going to work. It's going to give me something in Utah or some ridiculous place that's not applicable. Okay, so you do have to learn about datums, projections, um, reference systems, things like that, specifically latitudes and longitudes, and UTMs, both very helpful to know. One other thing that's very useful to know is how to convert between different types of latitude and longitude. So hopefully you're familiar with the format of lats and longs. So it's degrees, minutes, seconds. Okay, the number of degrees around the world, you can only go up to 180. Okay, degrees, if you're looking at longitude, that's away from a central line that runs north-south, um, approximately through Greenwich in England. Okay, as you're moving around the world to the east from Greenwich, the longitude lines are called east. As you're moving to the west, which is all of Canada, they're called west. Eastings, westings, things like that. And something interesting, if you're using things like Google Maps um, and a lot of different software systems, the way to differentiate between east and west is the numbers for the west, which is Canada, all have to have a negative sign in front of them. So if you have like a negative 63 degrees of longitude, we know it's west instead of somewhere in Istanbul or somewhere over there because it's got that negative sign. Now, if you go into a different system like UTMs, they do not require the negative signs because each grid is its own little uh, self-contained unit, okay? So with latitude and longitude, make sure you understand degrees can go up to 180 and the um, unless you're talking about north and south of the equator latitude those only go up to 90. Uh, if you're talking about minutes there's 60 minutes in a degree now all of these things can be further broken down into decimal points so you could have something like 12.4 seconds Okay, that's part of a bigger latitude or longitude. So let's say it's 35 degrees, 14 minutes, 12.4 seconds. Okay, so that decimal works out. Now, sometimes they will lop off the seconds entirely, and instead of having an integer in the minutes plus the seconds, they will just turn the minutes into decimal notation. So let's say that, uh, you know, there's 30, sorry, 60 seconds in a minute. So let's say that you've got a coordinate like 35, 14 minutes, 30 seconds. Okay, so that 30 seconds, if there's 60 seconds in a minute, and you've got 30, that's exactly half. So instead of 14 minutes, 30 seconds, you could also go 14 minutes plus half a minute. So 14.5. Okay, that whole concept can also get carried on. The degrees can be turned into decimal, and the minutes and seconds both lopped off. So you may see a notation, something like 14.23785 degrees, which kind of 
makes you understand what the minutes and seconds are if you do a little bit of uh, translation, mathematical translation. So it's a little confusing, but make sure you understand that before we get into some of this other stuff. Okay, so here's our setup file downloaded. It's pretty big, it's almost 400 megs. Um, so it'll take a while to download. Anyway, running it as an administrator just to be safe. Install. Next. I agree. Next. Now, I'm not going to install these American data sets. I'm just going to go install. Okay, everything's installed now. Let's put this uh, short top shortcut on the desktop so it's easy to load up. So, double click, start it up. Restoring loaded plugins. So, this is the important thing. When you start this up for the first time, we're going to want to go into the plugin manager right here, plugins. I'm going to go to manage and install plugins, and it's going to be talking to the internet right here. Okay, so we've got all these different uh, plugins, and you can see the status symbol on the left here installed, not installed, settings. Okay, there's a couple key plugins that you're going to want. Okay, GeoReferencer, GDAL. This one you have to have. So if you do not, if it's, if it's still green, click on this, go down to Install Plugin. Now, here's something important. This X, it looks like it's turned off, right? Well, no, that is turned off. And to turn it on, you click it and put the X in the box. So I don't know why they didn't put a check mark there. That would make a lot more sense. But anyway, X means turned on. So GDAL Tools is good to have turned on. GeoReferencer is good to turn on. I think they're only turned on in mine because I had the software installed before. Uh, GPS Tools is useful. Interpolation Plugin. Oh, I should turn that on. Uh, Meta Search Catalog Client. Make sure it's turned on. Open Layers Plugin. That's really quite important. And Oracle Spatial Geo Raster are useful. Processing, critical, that's got to be working. Quick map services, that's critical, that's going to be working. So the main three that, uh, that you absolutely have to have are processing, quick map services, and georeferencer GDL. Make sure all three of those are set up. Okay. So what we're going to do, I'm going to go through two projects. First, I'm going to create a map. Um, from Google Earth and I'm going to just do something in town and I'll do it from where I'm filming this right now so that I can go out afterwards and double check and make sure that it worked. Um, after that I'll do something on a bigger scale like say a, nas a national park or a provincial park or something like that so if I was going hiking I can put a map of the whole thing and show where I am within the park. So what we're going to do first is go to the web setting and we're going to go to Quick Map Services, and you can see that there's a whole bunch of options here. When you first install QGIS, you're probably only going to have four or five options. This is not enough. Okay, you want more. So what you're going to do is you're going to go under Quick Map Services, you go down to Settings, and then this will pop up, and you go over to More Services, and then you're going to go Get Contributed Pack, and it's going to automatically get and download, and then you can save close and then when you open up again you're going to see this full list that you didn't see before so that's important so let's go with something that everyone's familiar with Google uh, there's also things like Bing Bing's got maps and satellite data but we'll go with Google we'll go to Google satellite and loads up okay so I'm going to use my selection my zoom tool and I'm going to highlight drag and drop and there we've got Nova Scotia. I'm going to drag and drop again. And we're zooming in to a place called Truro, which is where I'm filming right now. Okay, now I just have to figure out exactly where we are. Uh,
Okay, I'm going to take the section of the map right here, this big square. Is that going to work? Yeah, I think that'll work pretty good. Okay, so that is the background map that I'm going to be using. Now, because this is coming from the Google satellite data, this map, it's like basically having Google Earth opened up inside, or Google Maps, open up inside QGIS. So this data is uh, the same as Google Earth or Maps. It has the lats and longs associated with it. And so if you move your little cursor around on the screen, you can see down here the coordinates are moving. Okay. Now, what I want to do next is I'm going to create an image. And so the image is going to be the basis of my map. Okay, so to do that, I'm going to go into actual Google Earth, and I have Google Earth Pro, which you can get for free now. And so I'm going to pick an address within that square. Okay, so we can see the same square. So I'm in Google Earth now. I've got my square, and I'm going to use this square as the basis for my map. Now, I'm going to try and play with this a little so it looks like I'm in directly overhead view. Everything I can see is on the screen, that's good. And so to save an image, I could do a copy, print screen, if I wanted. But let's go to Save Image, and you can either click on this icon or you can go to File, Save, Save Image. Either one works. Okay, description for the map. Well, let's call this uh, Geo Referencing Test Scooter. Okay. Uh, so now that we've got that, see this little set of uh, options? So we're going to have all those things saved. Yeah, I like that. That's fine. Whatever. Resolution. We're going to go to the highest possible resolution, maximum. And then save image. And so I'll just save it on the desktop. And I'll call this background image Turo. And I'm saving it as a JPEG. So this is uh, nothing fancy. There's nothing on this map. We'll go to the desktop. All this is is a JPEG. Okay, so there's no georeferencing in it, nothing, but we're about to do that. So let's go back into QGIS. Now you're going to want to open the georeferencer plugin. So to open the georeferencer plugin, you may see a tic tac toe board icon on one of the menus, top, left, right side of the screen, something like that. So I've got it. So I could click on that to open the georeferencer. Many of you may not have that, and so the other way to do it is to go into your raster menu, because we're going to be opening a raster image, a JPEG is a raster. So we'll hit that, and you can see georeferencer, georeferencer, so click on that. So now we have basically two different programs open. We have this georeferencer plugin, which is one program, and we have QGIS in the background, and we're going to flip back and forth between the two. So within georeferencer, your first thing, this is your open dialog, this is your processing key. This is to save and load GCPs, which are ground control points. This is your transformation settings. Uh, and here's some drag and drop and zoom tools. Okay, so let's go through this step by step. First, we're going to open a raster. And so I'm going to go to the desktop and I'm going to get my background image. And you're supposed to be able to set the proper coordinate system here. But because this is just a JPEG, it doesn't have coordinates. So what we're going to do is do cancel. Okay, and so my image, my JPEG, is now in the plugin. So remember, this plugin has a JPEG which has no georeferencing. QGIS in the background has Google Earth. So it has all sorts of information in it. And we have, because we're trying to correlate the two, I've got the same sort of image, same area in both. So what I want to do now is I want to do a bit of zooming in and I'm going to pick five different places and I'm going to add points. 
Okay, so this is a little convenience store here. I'm going to use this crosswalk and I'm going to add a point there. So I go to the add point tool and then I put the point there. Now, if I know the latitude and longitude, I can put them in here now. And so you can do this in full decimal notation. You can do it in, uh, which is like that. You can do it in uh, degrees, minutes, seconds notation. Uh, remember, because we're in Canada, you're going to have to have a negative number for the east within the latitude and longitudes. If you're doing UTMs, totally different system. Anyway, I don't know the latitude and longitude of this. I could take my phone or GPS unit, go down to that corner and get a reading, and then I know what it is and type it in. But I'm going to go from the map canvas. So what this does is goes over to the GIS, QGIS program, and lets me uh, pick a point that way. Okay, so I'm zoomed into the same area. Let's, uh, let's go back to the plugin. So from map canvas, and then I pick a point right there. And see how it's just populated those two fields with the exact latitude and longitude? So easy. I'm gonna hit okay. So flipping over to uh, QGIS, Let's see where our next one's going to be. We'll go over. Uh, we'll go over to this car right here. Pinkish car. Okay, so that's where the point's going to be. So in the plugin, add point. Click on the car. Get the coordinates from the map canvas. Done. Fills in the blanks. Okay. So we need to do this with uh, a fair number of points. It'd be nice to do it with at least five points. Um, let's go up here. Um, well, across from... Okay, we've got this uh, intersection up here above that house. And so we will find that on here too. Is that the same intersection? Yes, it is. Okay, so we're going to go to the plugin. We're going to press add point. We're going to pick the top of the stop line. And then it's put in the coordinates. Okay, so we have to do this with two more things. Now, I'll zoom out a little bit. Maybe it'll make more sense to you. Okay, so our next point, let's go across this and we'll use that line over there, move, so I'm going to pick that point there, add point in the plugin, then bring it from the map canvas, okay, and we'll do one last point, uh, we should have five just to be safe, Bloys Avenue. So within the plugin, pick point. Okay, there. So now, if we zoom out, we have five different points picked at this point. We have one here, one here, one up here, one over here, and one here. And they're tied in to the proper coordinates. So you can see down here, the latitudes and longitudes have been uh, punched in automatically by the software. So the next thing we're going to do, I'm going to save that set of coordinates. And so to do that, save ground control points. And so let's just put it on the desktop and we'll call it uh, Tro points. Okay, they're saved just in case we have to load them up again. Now, next step is we are going to process stuff now, if I start processing now without having gone into the settings, it's not going to work. It's going to say you need to set the settings. So watch. Please set transformation type. Okay, so there's a bunch of different choices here. 
and the best choices are polynomial 1, 2, or 3. You can only use polynomial 1 if you have 5 points or less. And since we only have 5 points, I'm going to have to pick that. If you have between 6 and 9 points, you can pick number 2, which is better. It works a little bit more uh, correctly, the algorithms and math behind it. And if you've got at least 10 points identified, you can use polynomial 3, which works the best. So I certainly could have taken more time to add 10 points to make it work well, but for now let's go with polynomial 1. We only used 5 points. Then you take your resampling method, and I found so far that cubic seems to work the best. Okay, now the next thing is target SRS. So if you go back, well, we can't do that easily right now, but if you go back into QGIS, you can kind of see down at the bottom corner, we've got this EPSG number, 3857. Okay, that is the coordinate system, projections, datum, whatever, that Google Satellite is using right now, and so we want to do the same thing. So, let's see if we've got that. We do, 3857. Now, if that wasn't up here as one of our choices, let's say that we were looking for 28640, well, I don't know, 20, 2961. Let's see if there's a 2961 datum. There is. It's one of the NAD 83s. Okay. So I could double click that, but, you know, that's not the right one. We don't want 2961, we want 3857 to match down here. Now, output raster. This is what we're going to have as our output map. So we're saving it to the desktop. I'm going to call this uh, Truro Image Geo Referenced. Now, in our drop-down menu, our only choice is GeoTIFF. And I know with Avenza PDF maps, I'm very used to working with PDFs. All our foresters give us georeference PDFs, not GeoTIFFs. Don't know why I can't save a PDF that's georeferenced, but for some reason, at the moment, I can't. Doesn't matter. It still works. GeoTIFFs work in Avenza. Uh, load in QGS when I'm done. Yes. Generate PDF map. I've played with this. All this does is generate uh, data for uh, error correction stuff. It has nothing to do with creating the map. So I'm going to leave that blank. I'm not going to change my resolution. I am going to have this checked. Use zero for transparency when needed. And then once all this stuff is done, hit OK. Now, you would think we must be done right now. Well, we're not done because we haven't processed it yet. Now, before I go any further, I want to point out one thing here, and that is that we may have a mistake, because look at these lines. Huh. That's a lot of red. And so it shows the error in the pixels. Let's uh, turn some of these off and see if we've got a mistake that we can get rid of. Now, right now, the errors are these big numbers. I would rather see errors down around one or less. So let's see what happens when we get rid of some of these. Lots of big numbers still. Let's try to get rid of this one. No, that doesn't help. Get rid of this one. No, doesn't do much. Get rid of that. No. Get rid of that. Okay, well, if we turn off that uh, point 0.4, at least we have... Uh, a lot lower numbers here. So I think that's maybe a good thing. So I think now point 0.4 was our last point. You can see this one here and see what's happened. I've actually put it in the wrong location. Okay, I picked a crosswalk but I picked the wrong one. So I'm gonna leave that turned off to make sure it doesn't screw up my map. And because I've got this turned off, I've got point, 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 those all have almost no red line attached to them. So those are fairly accurate. Okay, so I'm going to live with this. So now let's process it. We've already set up all our info here. Process. There. And it should be created. We look at our desktop. 
and we've got Truro image geo referenced. We double click on it. Well, it just looks like a normal image, but you can see this black border here and up here. It's because the image has been warped a bit to uh, match reality with the geo referencing process. So let's try. Uh, let's take that image, Tro image geo referenced. I'm going to drag it over to Dropbox. Uh, I guess I can't do that right now because the software is open. So we'll close the software. Project's good. We'll move that into Dropbox. And in the YouTube tutorial folder on Dropbox, I have Truro Image Geo Reference. Now that's pretty big, 41 megabytes. You know, images, once you start getting over 100 megs, some devices really have problems with them. So I wouldn't go much bigger than that. But anyway, this seems to be good. Now, there was an option when I was in those transformation settings where I could go with compression. And compression would have been smart. I should have turned it on. Because if I used one of the compression settings, this image probably would have been 3 or 4 megabytes instead of 40. So that's important to use. So at this point, our image has uh, been uploaded to Dropbox. So I'm going to go to my tablet. And on the tablet, I am going to Okay, so on the tablet, I'm going to go into Dropbox, and then we're going to go to YouTube Tutorial, Tro Image Geo Referenced. Oops, I'm going to make this available offline first of all. Okay, so now it has been made available offline. We're going to open with PDF Maps. Get rid of these other maps. We don't need those. So Toro image geo referenced. Now processing. Okay, shows that I'm on the map. Open up. Look, I am on the map because that's where I'm sitting as I'm doing this uh, video. Okay, so that's a good sign. So we'll take this out into the Jeep, and we'll take a little drive around, and we'll see if the uh, accuracy is pretty good. So at this point, you know how it's done. Let's do one more example, uh, just to walk you through it once more, just in case. And this time what we'll do is we'll assume we're going hiking. We're going to Fundy National Park in New Brunswick. So Fundy Park, let's... Uh, Let's look on Google, and if you look at a map of Fundy, so this is the outlines. So we go from Alma down to this uh, little tributary, and then we go up to the corner here on Route 114, and then we go to uh, Tian's Corner, I think is what that's called. So let's uh, search for Fundy. Okay, so here we have Fundy Park. Now, because we're in Google Earth, see I've lost my, my menus here, it's because this thing's open. So I'll kill that, all these controls come back. I'm going to make sure that we're looking down vertically, we are. And you can't really easily see where the boundaries of the park are right now, but that's okay. Teen's Corner, yeah. So first I'm going to export the image, so I go to this, Save image. I'm going to set the maximum resolution, that's good. And then I'm going to put this on the desktop. Background image Fundy. Okay, I shouldn't need Google Earth anymore. Okay, so once again, we're going to go to web. 
Quick Map Services, Google, Google Satellite. We're going to go to zoom in on Fundy. Okay, that's pretty good. So let's zoom in a little bit more. Uh, we'll move up. Okay, so this point is one that's going to be useful to me in a minute. So we will load the georeferencer. Let's go to raster, georeferencer, georeferencer. We're going to import our background image background image fundy. Uh, we don't have a coordinate system in it yet, so we're going to hit cancel. We're going to uh, zoom in somewhat so we can be more accurate with our points. Okay, so that's where our first point is going to be. And can we see it on our satellite imagery? Yes. Okay, so add point, point from map canvas, point. Okay, now let's uh, move over quite a bit to Tian's corner. Okay, so we're going to add a point right in the center there. I really should be zoomed in more, to be honest, if I want this to be accurate, but uh, you, get the, I mean, you get the idea of what I'm doing. And then from Tian's corner, let's go down to Alma. And in Alma, let's use that intersection there. Oops. Add point. And finally, our fourth point will go all the way over to that tributary in the southwest corner. see my three dots quite well. My three ground control points, I should call them, not dots. Okay, and there's our last point. We'll put it up at the top of that tributary. Okay, so are we going to save our points? Yeah, we may as well. Save ground control points. So we'll call this uh, Fundy Points. And then we will uh, go into our transformation settings. And we're still going to go with polynomial 1 because we only have four points. Remember, we need at least six to go to polynomial 2. We're going to stick with cubic. We've got the right EPSG code. That's good. Output raster. Well, we'll save this on the desktop and we'll call this uh, Fundy Map Geo. Well, it's not really a map. Well, it is a map. Fundy Image Geo Reference. That's a good name for it. And uh, compression. Pack bits. Okay, I do have compression turned on. There you go. 
I thought I didn't. And we're going to process it. Okay, and let's see what happened. Do we have uh, on the desktop? Fundy image georeferenced. Let's double click on it. Okay, so now because I want to test and make sure that worked, I'm going to close out QGIS. I'll discard the project. I'm going to move the Fundy image into my Dropbox folder. It starts uploading. I'll go back to my tablet. Now this time, I'm not going to be on the map because that's up in New Brunswick and I'm in Nova Scotia. So we should get an indication on the screen here in a minute of how far away the map is. And that might also give us an idea of whether or not it worked well. Because if it shows that we're 13,000 kilometers away from it, we know there's something wrong. And that happened when I was playing around with this earlier this weekend. It's kind of a frustrating uh, bit of software to play with at the start until you start getting a little more comfortable with it. It's easy to make mistakes, especially with the projection systems, with the uh, datums, references. Yeah, very confusing. And that shows that we are 117.5 kilometers away from Fundy. Okay, so if I was off hiking, I now have uh, a geo-referenced map that it doesn't matter if I don't have cell service. I can take my tablet and I'll always know exactly where I am. Now, there's other things that you can geo-reference. I mean, I can geo-reference a photo of a dog if I wanted. Of course, it doesn't do any good because it makes no sense. But, let's take another example. Let's say I've got a woodlot that I own, and here's the uh, official survey document. And this is interesting. I'll put this up uh, close up on the screen, but it's got all these different points here, and these points have coordinates. And these are in Northings and Eastings. These are uh, New Brunswick grid coordinates. It's not the same WGS system that Google Earth is using. But you can punch in, I can scan this map, which I've already done actually, scan the map, bring that image into QGIS, and instead of doing that thing where I'm copying from satellite data, I can just manually click on each of these points and just manually enter the coordinates of those points and georeference the map that way. And so I did that and it worked. Uh, you could also, depending what province you're in, there's different things like uh, New Brunswick has GeoNB and that's a pretty cool site. It's got this map viewer thing. And so if you open up the map viewer, I can zoom in and I can find this parcel. So let's uh, Okay, right up here. There we go. So this parcel right here, PID number 09090-4169, that is the same as this one. And so what I could do is I could zoom into this a little bit, and then I can Let's say that I want to use a little bit better background, so I'll use aerial background. Okay, yeah, I like that. And I'll leave that highlighting there so I can see the boundary. So I could do a control print screen, and then I could go into Photoshop. I can create a new image 
paste my screen capture in, flatten the layers. I don't need all this extra stuff, so let's just crop that a little bit. Image crop. And then I can save this desktop, and I'll call that uh, Walker Road Woodlot Background. And now, once again, I've got a JPEG that I can work with. I can go into QGIS. I can open my georeferencer, import that image, walk a road background. Okay, and then for the points, instead of referencing something else, I can click on the point and then just manually punch in this information. So I'm at the top, top corner. So I would punch in the coordinates, 0.310, northing and easting. And then I'd go on to the next one and punch in that one. And then I would go on and punch in that one and so on. And eventually I've got another georeference map. Uh, this one with the uh, from a different source other than Google Earth. Um, I also have, if you look at this, uh, so I did another one of the same thing. This is from Google Earth data from uh, just a few months ago, uh, back in the fall, and you can see all the all the leaves are turning on the hardwoods, and so that's why I picked that one. If you go into Google Earth. You can actually, um, you can change the historical data. And so to do that, uh, walk a road. So to do that, you can see this, that's, that's that woodlot that I was just looking at. And you can see down here it's got 2012. Well that's because there's all sorts of different versions of the Google Earth imagery. So this was obviously taken probably in uh, December, May, oh no, sorry, March 23rd, 2012. So you can still see some snow on the ground. We can move up. Well, that one's hard to identify. That's pretty foggy. That's pretty lush. That must be uh, summer. March 13th, June 18th, August 29th. Uh, there we go, 10-14-2016. So that was taken on October 14th of 2016. And you can see all the hardwoods. And so I figured I was going to use that as an image because it was really uh, it was really easy to see as I'm walking through the bush the difference between the hardwoods and the softwoods. And so having this map color-coded was quite helpful. And so what I did, it's brighter on this one, obviously. And that's just because I imported it into Photoshop and turned up the vibrance so I could see those color differences a little bit better. And uh, I also, on that woodlot, I scanned the survey and then just took the good part and so I georeferenced this. So I can also use this. So as I walk through that woodlot on my tablet, I can have this survey thing and I can see if I'm on the lines as I'm moving back and forth. Now the accuracy of this is not always great. Um, certainly if I was flagging a line to harvest a bunch of wood off it or plant up to a boundary, I'm not going to want to harvest wood 20 feet into somebody else's woodlot on the other side because my neighbor would be pretty pissed off. So I would want to go with actual land surveyor data for something like that. But if you want a rough idea of where boundaries are, this is pretty handy. So I think uh, I've gone into this in a lot of detail. I think the things you're going to find frustrating 
is, uh, again, the datums and the projections and stuff. So you'll have to learn that stuff a little bit better. But if you're doing the basic approach using Google satellite data, then you don't have to worry about translating anything. It's only when you start going into old survey plans and data from different sources sometimes that you have to get, uh, get a better understanding of how that all works. Uh, also, this is better for bigger things like the National Park example I used. Um, it's not really good if you're trying to identify the corners of a property. You're going to be off a little bit, but you know, sometimes being off by 20 feet isn't that important when you're just trying to get a rough sense of where something is. So, there's a lot more I think I have to learn about this, but uh, hopefully this is enough to get you all started with making your own georeference documents. And uh, thanks for watching.